We're going to turn back to the Word of God this morning in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, right at the beginning of the chapter, looking at verses 1 to 4 this morning. If you were here last Sunday morning for an epic, very long sermon. I don't know who was preaching, but my goodness, new records were, were forged last week. Uh, a fairly sensitive topic last week about marriage, about families, about headship, leadership, submission, words that really um, can be hard to process in our lives. Challenging stuff about love and about marriage. But Paul wants to follow that up this morning by moving, as he thinks about Christian families and households, from the bond between a man and a woman to the bond between parents and children. And I want to say that this message is relevant to all of us, whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we've had children, never had children, hope to have children, are about to have a child. It's relevant to all of us because we're all somebody's child and we're all part of a society where we need to support and encourage and be part of the lives of others. Now, if you found the topic a bit heavy going, a bit sensitive last week, today is sensitive as well. And it may be hurtful for some of us. So the title today is, Do Families Need Fathers? Do families need fathers? Let's hear the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So reads God's Word. Do children need parents? Do families need fathers. We're living in an age of real brokenness, are we not? Family brokenness, and there seem to be signs in our society of stress in the lives of children as never before, of mental illness in the lives of young people and young adults as never before. Something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't seem to be working. And although in some ways compared to past generations we're extremely wealthy, extremely rich as a society, our children seem to be starved of time and of security and of what they call now face time, time with an adult who loves them and cares for them. Even if we're in the same space, in the same room, maybe it feels as if a parent is busy with work or thinking about something else or busy with their own interests and their own lives, too busy to know or to notice children growing up who may be seen as a burden, who may be seen as an interference to adult freedom. What a disaster. I think children crave love and attention. That's obvious. But I think children also crave and need boundaries. They need to know when they're safe doing what they're doing and when they're going to be in trouble. And yet we seem to have a very strange attitude in our society just now where we seem to think, well, all I need to do is give emotional support to my child while my child works out whether murder is a good idea or not. It's nonsense. We're not just there to give money 
or a taxi service to our children or our grandchildren. We are there to teach our children and grandchildren the right path in life. And that means we've got to walk that path ourselves and teach our children how to walk it with us. And if our society is too selfish or too ignorant or too blind to do it, we are cursing our children and their children. Do families need fathers? What a stupid question, of course. Because we need God. And God has given fathers and mothers to help us know God as our Father. I've got three things. And again, this Word of God is a living Word of God, and it's like a sword, the sword of the Spirit. And swords can cut us and make us bleed. But it's good if God's Word touches us and it hurts. It's good because it will also heal us and help us. The three things I have for you today are absent honor. There's an honor of families and of parents and of dads that's missing in our culture today, absent honor. And then I want to talk about absent fathers, because frankly, many fathers are a disgrace and many parents are a disgrace, and we need to figure out what God is challenging to be and to do, and mums to be and to do. And the last thing is to think about God as the never absent father. So these are the three things, absent honor, absent fathers, and the never absent father. That's where we're going this morning. Absent honor then. Listen to verse 1. Children, obey, respect, honor your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then quoting one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So Ephesians is pretty clear about this matter. God demands that children give honor to their parents, and that means mom and dad. If you've got the notion that the Bible or Christianity or the New Testament is a deeply un-PC sexist document, no, and nor is the Old Testament. God says in the first of the Ten Commandments that is about life in human society, first four commandments are about us and God, but from commandment five to ten, they're about us and each other. And the first of those commandments about us and each other, the fifth commandment, says to the whole planet, to every human being who ever lives for all of time, respect, honor your mother and your father, your parents. That's God's plan. That's always been God's plan. God doesn't say, oh, lock up your woman and, and put a burqa over them or throw the rug over them and, and uh, six-year-old little boys, you must uh, tell your mom that you're in charge. No. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It is natural. It is part of God's right order for how things are supposed to be. Something's back to front if the parents are obeying the children. Something's back to front if a toddler runs the house. Something isn't right. And so God says to us, God insists on it. Children, honor your parents, mother and father. And you get this in Exodus 20, where the law of God, the Ten Commandments are given, and in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, which is probably the one being quoted here by Paul. Now, the interesting thing is, Paul says, children, obey. In the Old Testament, in both Exodus and Deuteronomy, what Moses says in the fifth commandment is, children, honor. Children, respect. And that's not the same as obey. And it's important that we notice that distinction. Because there are times when, actually, 
it's not right and it's not safe to obey everything a parent wants. I mean, last Sunday we were seeing that in, in the case of forming new families and marriage and what have you, that God's instruction there to um, usually, I guess, young adults is, leave your father and your mother. You're not under their authority anymore, and cleave to your wife, and two of you become one flesh. So, there's obviously a time where it is right to obey when children are young, when children are, are small, the way they respect parents and keep the fifth commandment is that they give obedience to parents. But things begin to get a bit more complicated as children grow up. They gain more responsibility before God for themselves. And the parents should always be shown respect, but not necessarily obedience. It's, I think, a little bit, if you want an illustration of who is the head of state? Who runs the country, the United Kingdom? Looking at the news in the last few weeks, you might think, no one. No more political jokes, I promise, this morning. It's the Queen. It's Her Majesty the Queen. Every act of Parliament is in her name. Queen's speech and all of that. But actually, the Queen doesn't propose any laws. Doesn't veto any laws. It's Parliament that does that. So, Parliament is honoring the sovereign by saying, Your Majesty, here's the law, will you sign it? But actually, she has to sign it. Your Majesty, your position is somewhat honorary. You're the head of state, but it's Mrs. May who flies around to other capitals trying to broker deals or other ministers of the crown. There comes a time where adult children should show honor to their parents by talking to them, by caring for them, by taking into consideration their, their pattern and their ideas and their wishes. But obviously, adult children do not have the same relationship with their parents that little children have. That's just common sense. But for young children, the commandment means obey in the Lord. Don't go against God's will. Don't go into sin, but obey in the Lord. So that's the next little bit of the slide. But where have we got to as a society? We've got into a place where honor or respect for parents seems to be countercultural today. We have a very child-focused, child-centered education system. I'm not sure that's wise or right. And we have neurotic parents bringing up neurotic kids where the roles are all over the place and where nobody seems to have any authority unless it's the government that wants to step in and say, we are the authority. Not mom, not dad, but the government. That's a very dangerous place to be as a society. And I want to say that the fifth commandment, what Paul says in Ephesians 6, and what Moses taught in Exodus and Deuteronomy, is that God demands that society honor good and godly family life. Clearly, society can step in to correct evil. Society can step in to correct abuse. And the church has to do that too. There will be times when church discipline will be appropriate because of a terrible pattern of parenting or abuse. There will be times when someone will be excommunicated because they are not behaving as a father or mother should. I, I think we might tremble at that, but... It seems to me if the commandments mean anything, and if belonging to a church means anything, there will be times when as a fellowship we will try and help families to battle through problems. But there may come a time where a fellowship says, you cannot carry on behaving like that. 
You're destroying other people. It must stop. So there's an absent honor in our society. I, again, I'm not going to be political, but I want to talk about something in our culture, in our society just now, which is called getting it right for every child. And we want the state and schools and social work and the health service to get it right for every child. But I, I thought I'd do a little bit of research last week, and I went online and I found some government documents about this policy of getting it right for every child in Scotland. And I actually found something published about five, six years ago, which uh, really drives education and social attitudes. And I think it's not one particular political party. I think you'll find there's pretty broad political agreement that this is the way to go. Child-centered, child-focused, supposedly, so that every child thrives and what have you. So there's a framework document with lots of pie charts and diagrams that runs to 27 pages for getting it right for every child. And it contains words like putting the child at the center. And as a Christian, I have to say, well, no, we, we don't put the child at the center. We put God at the center. I wouldn't really expect the government to say that. But I would expect the government to respect families and the role of parents. And that's pretty thin in that 27-page document. The government seems to think children need to be protected largely from the views and the values of their parents if they're to be charged children who are safe, healthy, achieving, nurtured, active, respected, responsible, included, all probably good things. But you know, there's something missing, badly missing from that government framework. In those 27 pages, you read about lead professionals, you read about named persons, you read about people who look after me, you read about family, but the word father isn't in the document anywhere, and the word mother isn't in the document anywhere. Are we so politically correct that we cannot honor the role of fathers and mothers when we're talking about getting it right for every child? Come on, wake up, Scottish Parliament. Wake up. Wake up. MSPs. Wake up MPs. Wake up social work. Wake up health professionals. Wake up teaching professionals. This is daft. The honor that is due and the respect that is due to good parenting is missing. It's absent. And the church needs to wake up and teach this. We need to support and disciple and train and help and educate ourselves so that even if our society is going down the toilet in our homes, we know we are to be God-centered and that we are to treasure and value godly family life that follows God's patterns. Can dads get it right for every child? Well, no, because every dad I've ever met, including my own wonderful father, every dad I've ever met is a flawed sinner. And some dads cannot be followed. And some dads need to be grieved over and wept over. But it does not negate the strength of Ephesians 6 and Deuteronomy 5, and Exodus 20, that God has an ideal and God has a plan where fathers and families are at the key of a thriving society, that it may go well with you and your land. Respect parents. Whether the government is in London or in Edinburgh, respect families. Stop interfering with families. There is absent honor when children do not obey, when children do not respect, 
and when society thinks that professionals should be more important in a child's life than mum or dad. Absent honor. But what about absent dads? You know, dads are very imperfect. So the second thing this morning is absent fathers. And now absent fathers could mean that dad is dead. Absent fathers could mean that fathers have left the family. Absent fathers could mean a lot of things, couldn't they? But I want to suggest to you that in this very respectable, very nice congregation of ours, that there is a huge, huge danger that most dads are absent, are missing from the role that God intends for them in their families. And I think it's an epidemic in our land, and I think it's an epidemic in our church and in the churches of God in Scotland that fathers are not getting it right for every child in the church. What am I talking about? Well, Paul speaks to the fathers in verse 4. He talks in verses 1 to 3 about fathers and mothers, parents, and their role. But then he specifically talks in verse 4 about fathers. And he says, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Don't provoke your children to anger or to stress or to distress. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you're not training your child in the way of God and godliness, if you're not training your child in the way of the Bible and worship and truth, this society will take over and will train your child for you. Our culture will train your child in the ways of an ungodly and unbelieving age. So, dads, if you are absent as a spiritual leader and teacher and role model and example, your children will suffer. Now, I think some of us are squirming here because we're thinking, absent father, well, I've gone through a relationship breakdown and he's talking about me. I am talking about you, and I'm talking about me, and I'm talking about every grandfather and every father and every mother and every grandmother in this place and everyone who listens to this sermon online or whatever. We all are often absent when we are not stepping up to God's high calling for us to lead children to God and God's love. And the way that we do it, dads, is by not being authoritarian or cruel or whatever, but by being godly. So dads, do not crush your child. Dads, do not neglect your child. Dads, do not put yourself in front of your child or you may produce a very angry child, a depressed child, even a suicidal child. Fathers, says the Bible, don't provoke, don't exasperate your children. And it seems to me that very often we're so busy, we, we're thinking, I'm providing money for that child. I see them on their birthday, unless there's something really busy at work. I have loads of regrets about life, loads of regrets about the way I managed time and the way I've managed years of marriage and years of being a parent. And I thank God for his grace that overcomes my many sins and faults and failings. It was a privilege to work from home when the children were little and to be around them as they were growing up. But so often, work, even Christian work, seemed to crowd out time. 
It's not right. Do we know our children, really know? Can we, can we have a conversation with our children so that we get to the root of why they might be angry or why they might be sad? Or are we exasperating them? It's so difficult to get the balance right. Children need to know there are boundaries. Children need to know that there are times when the godly thing to say to them is, no, I told you this is what was happening. Don't rebel. But children also need to be encouraged and developed and praised. And children need to be shown. One of my children is a little clumsy, and it's the only person I know who regularly falls upstairs. Not falling going downstairs, but falling going upstairs all the time. The, the feet seem to be on a different plane to the rest of her body. She's the most wonderful child. Now, you don't lecture and you don't get annoyed with a child who's prone to trip or fall. You live with it and you encourage them and if they hurt themselves, you pick them up and you kiss them better. But getting frustrated will just make it worse. But a child who's throwing tantrums is different. Dads, are we absent? from training and instructing in the Lord. Many of us here took vows, baptized our children or had a dedication for our children and made vows to God. Have we been doing well with those vows? What will cause children to grow up towards God so that they're confident in their relationship with God? What will help them? The highest calling of a father is to so represent God to your child that they confidently grow up towards God. Oh, I hope whatever else I achieve by the grace of God with my wife in our life together, I hope that at the end of our lives we will see children who know God and love God. Education, take it or leave it. Career, take it or leave it. But to grow up to be confident before God, to be able to call God Father, you can't put a price on that. Represent God. That's your calling. Absent honor. Our culture needs to rediscover obedience and respect within families. Absent fathers, repent, Dad. Put right what can be put right if it's been wrong, even if it's been wrong for years. Folk who are hurting because Dad was not what he should have been, Ask God to help you to forgive, but don't be held back by a mere human father who was absent or cold. You know, Luther, what a wise man Luther was. Luther said something really wise about the way culture goes. Luther said that human culture tends to overreact to problems and come up with deeply flawed solutions. Now, that's how I would express it in posh 2017. But what Luther actually said was that our culture ends up acting like a drunk man trying to get onto his horse. Luther used better, bolder language than me. So a drunk man, he tries to get onto the horse and he climbs up on the left hand side and he's up and then he's over and he falls down on the right hand side and he bruises himself. So he goes to the other side of the horse and he thinks, I fell to the right last time so I'll be very careful not to fall to the right this time. And he gets up onto the horse and he falls to the left side. You got the picture? 
we stagger from one wrong emphasis to another wrong emphasis. Well, since about 1970, our culture has been saying to us, parents, let children discover their own values. Rubbish. Parents, don't try and impose yourself and your values on your children. Just give them emotional support and they'll work it all out. Let them choose their own path. Rubbish. Victorian parents, they were authoritarian. The parents of the first century AD in the Greco-Roman world of Paul and the Ephesians, they were tyrants. So let's swing from that extreme. Let's fall off the horse, not that way, but let's fall off the horse this way where it's all child-centered and giving so many choices to children that they're stressed out of their boxes. Ten choices for breakfast, ten choices in the wardrobe, ten choices in what you want on the TV or on the iPad. It's exhausting. Toddlers are stressed. It's mad. We need children to learn that they have a place in a family that is secure and supportive and loving with God at the center. Don't fall off the horse on the left side or on the right side, but hold on by faith to the love and grace of God and pray for your kids every day and pray for the children of the church. Absent honor, absent fathers, and the final thing is the never absent father. Maybe the father that you remember is a father that you find it nearly impossible to respect. At their best, a godly father will imitate our father in heaven. That's how Ephesians 5 and 6 works. We are to imitate God, to imitate Christ. And we are to work that out in our human relationships by the grace of God. At our best, dads, at our best, mums, we show something of God to others. But at our worst, we are a huge barrier to the next generation knowing the truth about God. Are you an absent dad? Repent. Are you a dad who might as well be absent because you're so focused on yourself and your own things? Repent. Jonathan Edwards was a revival preacher in New England in North America several centuries ago. He was a good and a godly and a brilliant man. But like every father, he was not a replacement for God. And when Edwards knew that he was dying, he called one of his children, one of his daughters to him, a child who believed, and spoke very tenderly to her. And he gave her a message for her siblings, for her brothers who were not Christians. And Jonathan Edwards' dying message to his unbelieving, unconverted children was this. Look to a father who does not die. As a father, I will disappoint all my children. I wish I didn't, but I will. And as a father, the day will come when I will not be there for my children or their children. So I need and they need and you need a father who will always be there. We need to look to the father who cannot die and the father who will not let us down. And by God's grace, there is such a father. The Father of our Lord Jesus can be my Father and the Father of my children and your Father. 
Abba, Father, says Jesus, and he teaches us to pray, Abba, Father. Abba, Father, how shall we pray, Lord Jesus? Pray like this, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father, Jesus' Father, and my Father. Look to that Father if you've never looked to him before today. There's nothing more important than that you can know that you are God's child and that he has adopted you into his family and that even if your experience of family life has been painful or tough in this life, there is a never-absent father that you can rely on. Not every human father is wise. Not every human father is good. And not every human father can be obeyed. Not every mother is kind. But God is a good father. Have you read Psalm 103? The pity, father-like, tender love of God runs through that psalm. Father-like. Have you had an abusive parent? How difficult. Take your grief and sorrow over that to God as a father who will not crush you, as a father who will not exasperate you, his child. Rely on the steadfast, fatherly, tender love of God for you and the brotherly love of Jesus. There is one parent who will not let you down, and he adopts children, and he treats them well. Thank God for that. Do you have a Father in heaven? Would you love to have a Father in heaven? Then reach out to him. Tell him you're sorry about the ways in which you did not obey or respect your parents, or could not. Tell him about the ways you are sorry that you have failed as a parent or as a relative of children when you had opportunities to train or instruct you did not. Ask God for grace to begin a new relationship with parents and children that is God-centered. And do it because you are reaching out and saying, O oh, Father in heaven, take hold of me, take hold of my life, and hold me. I love that song we've been learning recently. He will hold me fast. He will. He, our Father in heaven, will train and instruct us, will nurture and encourage. We need to be taught and discipled, but we need to be encouraged as well. Our hearts need a Father, and our heads need a Father, and our wills need a Father. Dads, step up. Moms, step up. Parents, step up. And all of us, myself included, stretch out your hands to God. Father, like he tends and spares us, he knows you. He loves you. Call on him today. Gracious God, love us with your fatherly love and bless us in our homes and families with tenderness that we may Show your love and glory in the way we relate to one another. Forgive us and wash away the stains and the hurts where we've got this so wrong. Bless our nation so that indeed we will get it right for every child, not by being child-centered, but truth-centered, love-centered, peace-centered, God-centered, gospel-centered in the way we care for our young. Hear us and help us for Jesus' sake.